All right, we're going to begin a new series this evening. I guess it's a series. Um, we're going to uh, talk about some things this evening, kind of an introduction on ethics before we get into the actual, some topics that we can actually uh, kind of debate or argue over or whatever you want to call it. Ethics is kind of a strange thing. We're all, uh, uh, we all have already pre-programmed our ethics at this point. So you're saying, well, why would we want to change that? Well, we'll, we'll see. Maybe you'll have an opportunity to uh, understand what I'm talking about. This is, this is what it's called, Christian Ethics, and in our introduction this evening. Uh, but before we start looking, I wanted to kind of set up some ground rules for the class, um, because there, there's, uh, there can, people can get their feelings hurt, as you can see now in, the, in our society, if you don't agree with someone, then you're bad. You're almost an enemy. You're, uh, you're not welcome anymore. We've, we've forgotten how to have different opinions and still love one another, at least in the, in the world. Hopefully we're trying to fight that in our church. We don't do that. But that's one of the things. That's why we need to kind of lay down some rules. So rules to live by in this class. Number one, we need to agree that it's okay to disagree because many of the ethics that we do uh, have no concise answer. You know, there's no rock solid yes or no. We need to, so we need to open up and be willing to learn, maybe change our habits uh, or adapt them somewhat or handle, but handle it always with respect and with agape, which is unconditional love. So if you don't agree with me or you don't agree with someone in the class as we go, please remember that. Uh, like Thomas Campbell said years and years ago, that uh, in things of doctrine, we want to be unified, unity. In things of opinion, then we have liberality. And in things, all things, he says, we do in love. So if we can remember those three things, that'll help us a lot. Unity, liberality, and love. We have to realize that we are not untouched by our ethical uh, opinions. We've been raised uh, and taught our, uh, in, by society and tradition and Hollywood and parents, neighbors, friends, all these things have encompassed us to form our ethics. Okay? What we're going to try to do in here is try to reform those a little bit to make sure that they're in line in what a Christian value would be. So we will go on and say, recognizing the various views and the reflection of our own ethical convictions will help us focus toward better ethics based on Christ and the word in the scriptures. Another rule that we need to remember not to bind on others things which are unbindable. And we tend to do that in the world. This is the way I see it and therefore it's right. Well, I may be wrong. I may be dead wrong. But I don't agree with them, so that makes me right. No, that's not the way it works. We can't do it that way. And we, won't do, we don't want to do that here either. Jesus said that we love God and love your brother. And I've often wondered, could, could it really be that simple? But that's not simple, is it, to love your brother, especially when your brother disagrees with you. So... Uh, we need to stop forcing everyone to think just like ourselves necessarily and love them instead for their difference. It may be okay. They may not be wrong. They may just be looking at it from a different angle. Christian ethics is the most reliable methods and views that I believe that we can have. God is goodness personified. So if we look at his uh, goodness, he's given to us as Christians. We're supposed to be goodness, not our goodness, but God's goodness. He is goodness. We just get the gift. We have love. 
God doesn't have love. He is love. There's a big difference. That uh, he is it. This is where we need to go to for what our foundation will be when we decide on ethics. And I look to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there's no such law. That's what we hopefully will be able to do with our uh, class for the rest of this quarter. I got most of my information, I won't say most of it, from three places. From, the first one was from this guy, Norman L. Giesler. And he had Christian ethics, options, and issues. The second source was David Jones, David C. Jones, excuse me, Christian ethics. And my main source that I could get as much as I could was the Bible. And that was authored by God. So I put that in there. Since we've honored all the other authors, we need to honor God as well. So let's begin with some things that's been on my mind and, and maybe on yours. Uh, First thing is, why do we need a uh, Christian ethics class to begin with? Well, we've got to learn to deal with what's morally right and wrong from the Christian point of view, teaching us to love one another even when we don't see eye to eye. And then help us not only to see one another, but to pass that along to the next generation or two so that they handle their ethics the same way. Just what are ethics? Well, most people think that ethics are just rules of conduct and how they apply to the complex circumstances of life. But ethics is, we think, basically right and wrong, right? Isn't that what you normally think of? Ethics? What's ethical? Well, it's right or it's wrong. It's black and white. But it's also about the kind of persons that we should be as we're learning this. In other words, ethics is a character issue for Christians. Think about that for just a second. Your character is shown by your ethics. What you think is right and what's wrong. People look at you and say, well, where are they coming from? Where did they get that idea? Hopefully, we can say, you know, well, this was what God intended on us to do. He's the ultimate one to judge right and wrong, not us. Everything old is new again. How many times have you heard that? It was a good song for a while at one time. I mean, everything old is new again. Because all the things that we're battling have been battled over the centuries. Um, I've got some Greek philosophers we're going to look at in just a few minutes. And you'll see that the things that we go up against are the same things that they went up against. But Christian views on ethics is... I think and believe that's the best way that we can attack the things that, uh, that are in the world. So what are ethics? The modern definition, simply stated, is that ethics deals with what is morally right or wrong. That's the dictionary's version. It deals with what's morally right or wrong. Now, the earlier views kind of uh, slanted that a little bit. Uh, the philosophies created some more, or created more problems than they solved in a lot of ways. Uh, Thrasym Thrasymachus, I think is that way I pronounce that guy's name, but he's dead. He don't care whether I get it right or not. So we'll just call him that for this time. And he was an ancient Greek philosopher and whose moral conduct was might is right. And we've heard that before. We've, sometimes in politics today, we hear it. But justice is in the interest of the stronger party, was his quote. So what's morally right is defined in terms by who has the power. Might is right. Think about somebody with that kind of ethical. The one that comes to mind to me is Hitler. Or maybe Saddam or Stalin, might was right. They had the power. They would make you do what they believe was right. Maybe not what was right. Protagor uh, <laughs> Protagoras, 
uh, an ancient Greek philosopher also, this, and this is going back quite a few years. Folks. Man is the measure of all things. We can run into a lot of trouble with that in a hurry, can't we? Knowing the way man is, each individual, their will would be what is right or wrong. That's the standard. Well, that's good if a guy happens to be very, very moral in our eyes, but what if he's tyrannical or hateful or cruel or mean or uh, what if he's a member of the KKK? You know, that's, uh, he's thinking on his own there. He's the measure of all things. I, you know, that's what he believes, so that should be his ethics. The human race is another philosophy. The human race is the basic of right the part that doesn't determine what's right for the whole, but for the part. So the part doesn't determine it, the whole determines to everybody else what the part is. More philosophies, Aristotle, ancient Greek, morality found in moderation. That was uh, almost uh, almost got to Epicureanism, which we'll talk about in just a second. But morality found in moderation. That's not a bad thing, is it? I mean, I think about eating, and uh, maybe I'd use a little more moderation, and it, it might be a little more ethical to what we do. But it's, it can still create some problems because uh, the pride that goes along with with that, if you're, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm thin and I'm, I'm petite or whatever, the, you know, in one case, we're just using weight right now. But you can think about something of that nature and where you're, uh, and, and it's even biblical. Philippians uh, 4, 5 says to uh, let your moderation be known to all men. Well, that's, that's a, a basis for some of the ethics. I don't think that's all the basis biblically. But it does make a good general guide anyway, if nothing else. Ep Epicurus, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher, said that pleasure was right and pain was wrong. So if it gives you pleasure, it's good. If it gives you pain, it's bad. Um, I can see a lot of problems with that philosophy if that's the only one you're using as well. In the mid-17 to 1800s, it evolved into uh, most pleasure, least pain. It was kind of the same thing. They just extended it a little bit and said uh, it, most pleasures and least pain. The greater number of persons, what's actually good for the whole is good for everyone. If it's, a, you know, you have to fit in. You have to follow right along. And what we're seeing is that moral values is an end, but not a means. There's a lot of ways to get to it. And right is what desir is desirable for its own sake. We want it to be right because it's right. We don't want it to be right because it's necessarily what I think is right or what you might think is right. We want right to be right because it is right. So we're going to look something at, uh, I went right past that, so we'll go on to this one. Oh, there we go. Incorporated into ethics. Or is it ethics? We look at morals. Is that ethics or is that incorporated into ethics? We put it in there. It implies that we are uh, conforming with the general accepted uh, standards of goodness. That that's what we think. That's what uh, what everybody thinks. And sometimes it's specifically used for sexual conduct rather than something different. How about mores? You ever heard of those mores? Those are kind of folk ways. Well, that's the way they used to always do it. You know, or give me that old time religion. You know, that's that's what a more is, and that's what sometimes evolves into our ethics. That that's the way it's always been done. It's uh, it's been generation after generation, and so that makes it right. Yeah, I, 
your comment on your slide, moral ethics is a means, not an end. Is that correct? Could you explain that a little, kind of what you're talking about there? I'm, I'm wrestling with what that means. With what means? I'm sorry, I can first part. Which one are you wrestling with? A couple of slides earlier, you had a comment about moral ethics is a, a end, not a means, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. What, what specifically are we talking about there? I, I don't quite understand that. I understand the words, but I don't understand what's being said by that. Okay, well, hang on. Maybe we'll answer your question as we go along, okay? So, Michael? Well, I think what you were suggesting is that our ethics is what ultimately creates our morals. Right. That's, that's the, the ethics of the way that you do things, you know, and the way you do things, if you do them correctly, you arrive at what is good, what is moral. Okay. Did you hear that? Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you for clearing Mike. Moore's virtues, uh, virtues implies what? Uh, normally an excellent character. Usually we think of someone who's very virtuous as being very morally uh, correct. And uh, it's often referred to uh, specifically to chastity when we talk about being virtuous uh, women in the Bible. We're thinking of that more than anything. Righteousness is another one. Values, Christian ethics, those three. Righteousness uh, implies being morally blameless or at least justifiable. Uh, and the only true one who's righteous, of course, is God. And, of course, Jesus Christ himself as well. The values, uh, social principles, goals, or standards are held in the, or accepted by an individual class or society. So it doesn't always depend upon your standards, it depends on whose standards that we adapt. And those values can be either good or bad. Uh, think about how the morality has changed in the last 50 years and how the people have, uh, have adopted different values now, uh, even down to very simplistic things in our schools, you know, where you can't, uh, you can't have prayer in school anymore. That's been a long, you know, the last 10, 15 years. But before that, when I was growing up, we had that. We had the Pledge of Allegiance. We studied the Constitution. All those things now are, are not valuable anymore. So those values have picked up for some people will develop into their ethics. They will believe this is what's supposed to be right. If you're having prayer, that's wrong. It's against your ethics. Malachi because God doesn't change. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. And James 1.17 says, Every good gift, we know this scripture very, very easily, but every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. This is where I, that we're eventually, going, hopefully we'll get to, and as we form our ethical codes. There are some major ethical systems and they're defined kind of, at least one way, by an answer to the question, are there any non-objective ethical laws? Or are there any ethical laws not purely subjective, but are binding on humans in general? Well, my question came up when I was looking at this as a, what does that what is an objective? What's the difference in an uh, objective law versus a subjective ethical law? Well, the objective is fact-based. It's measurable. It's reason-driven. It's a, a way of determination. It's uh, that's the way it is. Okay? That's objective. The subjective, on the other hand, is a, a personal taste, emotional state, opinion, 
that's what bases our determination, and that's what's influenced by all the things I mentioned earlier, by our, our upbringing, our families, our friends, our Hollywood, books, anything, and hopefully the scripture is included in that. So it takes a combination, I think, of both of those things in order for us to come up with, with an ethical determination kind of thing. How we see the world. Actually, I thought this was a good quote. Depends on the lens we look through. If you think about that for just a moment, I watched a, a car wreck not too long ago, and I saw it on the news, and they saw it from a whole different angle than what I saw it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, uh, I thought the driver was at fault. They come up and said, no, he wasn't at fault. It was the other guy. And I'm thinking, okay, well, my d decision for right and wrong was quite different. And if you watch any news at all, you'll find out that your ethics do not line up with what we see on, on the news in, in the evenings most of the time. So that's something that's kind of, we have to kind of uh, keep in mind as we, as we, form our judgments, and our judgments come from our ethics, what we believe. So how we see the world in both ways can be beneficial, whether it's subjective or objective. I think you probably need both. The objective is kind of the opening of our eyes, um, but it, it doesn't leave much room for gray. With the subjective, on the other hand, everybody doesn't have the same perspective. So we gotta kinda of combine those two, and kind of, as Harold used to say, you take the meat and throw away the bone. There are, well, there we go, I already mentioned that, so we'll go past that one and go to this one. Both can have a disadvantage as well. The objective can leave you no gray area. It's strictly a matter of fact. There's no compromise at all allowed. Subjective, again, not everyone has the same perspective. Think about uh, Christians and Muslims. They both have ethics. Are they the same? I don't think so. Um, our ethics are based on, on our Bible. Their ethics are based on their Koran. So we've got two different things, both of them saying this is what's ethical, this is what's good, this is what's right. And it's, again, this is why when we go through this, we have to keep these things in our mind when we get into the actual topics of what we're talking about because otherwise uh, we're not going to give anybody uh, a chance to, to say anything different. Uh, so often, I, you know, we look at other religions and we say, oh, man, you can't, you, you know, you can't talk about the, the, the Baptists or the Methodists or the Lutherans or the Catholics uh, because they're, they're all wrong. Well, there's some good things in all of them and things that we could adopt in our own ethics. But we still have to stay, if we adopt that, is it in line with Scripture? We just don't take something at, its, at the so-called face value, we have to, to grind it out. We have to look at it. This one is called anti-nomanism, or relativism is a better word for it, I think. It legally means, or literally means, um, against or instead of law. This is one of the uh, major ethical systems that, that is in use. There's no moral law. Anything is okay. It denies all universal and all general laws. Believing that everything is kind of in a state of flux. It's, it's, since it's moving, we look at the universe and everything is shifting. It's never in the same place. It's always moving. The, the earth itself is alive as it, it regenerates its own by uh, volcanoes and, and hurricanes and weather reshapes everything. Everything, nothing's, nothing's the same. Nothing stays the same. But yet, they say that because of that, there can be no absolutes. Nothing can be absolute. And of course, the things, some of the things that quickly come to mind, I think about the Ten Commandments. That's 
to me, there's a lot of absolutes in that. And yet, there's under this uh, relativism, everything is relative, everything is in flux. Um, it's based on that subjective or personal interpretation again. It results in consequentialism, which is a hard word for me to say, but in other words, uh, what's right is determined solely by its consequences. So if it's a good, if it turns out good, it was a, it was a good thing. If it turns out bad, well, too bad. You messed up your ethics. Generalism. Rules are mostly right, but they can be broken if the results are good. That's the one that says the ends justify the means, isn't it? We hear that so much. The ends justify the means. We can go ahead and break an absolute if the results are good. We can go ahead, and there's, there's uh, some truth to each one of these to a degree. There are some things that have no absolute law. There are some things that have some absolute law. All these things are, are what we will consider as we go through this when we talk about our subjects. Situationalism, any moral rule except love can be broken for love's sake. This is one where they use a lot of scripture to justify it. You know, Jesus said there's two rules, didn't he? You love God and love your brother. So that falls under, under this particular moral category, moral system. Doesn't mean that's the only thing that goes along with it. It's also okay to have those little white lies. The ones where your wife answers the phone or your husband answers the phone, you say, tell him I'm not here. I'm not here. Okay, is that, is that true or is that not true? <laughs> so are we are we lying and that's okay because it's not really unethical or is it? See, it's even the littlest things that we do that we don't even realize it's that's caused because of our values and the ethics that we follow. Absolutism. This by definition says it's perfection, complete, uncompromising, whole, timeless. But it's more than that. Uh, it says there's there's no way we're going to, it, it can be any other way. It's absolutely that way. That ethic, particular ethic that we're thinking of, whether it's it's morality, uh, not morality, um, uh, whether it's, uh, um, ah, I just went blank on what I want to say. Whether it's some other particular reason, whether it's it's way somebody dresses and uh, whether it's modest, or whether it's not, we're, are we going to call that uh, an absolute? Well, we kind of can't. But unqualified absolutism, there's, in that one, there's uh, truth only and never any exceptions. So if it's true, you can't, you, it's got to be, got to be so. If Linda asks me, does this dress make me look fat? I'm in trouble because ethically I should be doing the truth and never any exceptions. And the only answer I can come up with is no, you know, you don't look fat. The dress makes is, is fat. <laughs> it's, it's not you. Conflicting absolutionism. And that's okay to break a moral law, but it causes one to sin when you do. So you have to ask God to forgive you for breaking that law. Now the first one, the unqualified absolution, was an anti-Baptist tradition in the Middle Ages. That was qual that was you had to, to be that way for everything. This one came along with Lutheranism in the Reformation period. And then we have graded, there it is, graded absolutionism breaking a law lesser than the higher law. And this is the one that's, um, a good example would be during World War II when the Germans hid the Jews 
And then when they say, you know, are they here? No, they're not here. We have, you know, we don't have anything to do with that. And they covered it up because they were saving a life. That was a higher law than telling a lie. You see where that's coming from? Graded absolutionism. And I think we use that one probably as much or more than any in our uh, ethical conclusions. The ethics, uh, Christian ethics, should be based on consistency. God is what God, or good is what God wills. Jesus said that there was nobody good but God. So what he wills is what should be um, our uh, goal. Oh, I thought that was my bell. <laughs> All right, good. His judgment should be made with grace and faith and obedience. I think that's what is going to cover us as Christian ethics. The ultimate guide. That's uh, what God's will is. Because it comes from God. It's based on his revelations. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So if we base it on God, this is what we're looking at, Romans 8, 1.18. His morals don't change. If we're basing it on God's, ours won't change much either. Morals change with, uh, with very little uh, encouragement in a lot of ways. We watch every year something else has changed that used to be immoral and now is not immoral any longer. Christian ethics should be absolute if it's coming from God's perfection, our perfect and unchanging nature. If we're basing it there, it's okay. God said, do not murder. Okay? Has that changed? Not over the years. It was in the Ten Commandments. But again, God's will does not always bind us, bind everyone for every, in every condition. Because if you look, he told Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree. That was a, a binding law for them. That was a, an absolute, don't eat from the tree. But we don't have that absolute. It's not longer, we're not longer, uh, or no longer obligated to stay away from that tree. It's not here anymore. But it was there. So that particular absolute does not hold over for us today. But thou shalt not murder does. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You go through the whole list. And the only, that keeps Sabbath is the only one that doesn't apply to us. But it applied to the Jews, the early Hebrews. Christian ethics are prescriptive and not descriptive. God prescribes it for us like a pharmacist. And he deals with what ought to be, not necessarily what is. It's real easy for us to, to adopt to the morals of today. I, I look at movies and how easy it is for us to say, well, you know, rated R's, not, not rated X, so I guess that's probably okay now. Or PG is, you know, PG-13 is better than, or worse than PG, and, you know, and R is worse than PG-13, and so we've got a, a graded situation to judge our ethics. Someone else is making that choice for us. They got a committee that sits in Hollywood and says, well, we're going to rate this this way because it has so many nasty words in it or so much nudity or so much blood and, and gore. That's the way we'll grade it. So God doesn't do that. God prescribes it for us as the standards of Christians. It's not the standards of Christians, but it's the standards for Christians. It's the Bible. That's where we have to go. And we can go in there, and if you read it and you study it, you won't have a whole lot of problems with your ethics because God shows us how we're supposed to live. And how we're supposed to live will reflect our ethics.
Christian ethics do not neglect resulting effects. What do you mean by that? As I stand up here, I have to think about that all the time, about the possible effects of my words. And everyone that stands in, in a public podium and speaks to you should be aware of the effect of their words. And yet we still, you know, mess up as far as that goes. I'm still still capable of offending someone, still capable of of doing uh, what's unethical, you know, to someone else. But I need to look at it and try to come up with the truth and use it maybe diplomatically. Um, like I mentioned a while ago with Linda saying, does this dress make me look fat? You know, it's not gonna do me any good to say, no, it's a lipstick. I've gotta come up with something better than that. But I have to come up with something that's truthful or at least tactful or something that shows mercy, or something that shows a conscience. These are all things that are, that are Christians' ethics for us, those things of, of diplomacy and tact and mercy and, and conscience. Our opinions that we have shouldn't be absolute. If it's opinion, remember what we were talking about with Campbell a while ago. That's where we go with the liberality. If it's opinion, if it's if it's uh, if it's gospel, as we would say, yeah, then we stick with it. That's an absolute. It's absolute that we have to have baptism. Okay, it's not our opinion as to how we do it. It's not left to our opinion whether we sprinkle or whether we pour. God said absolutely, you will be baptized, you'll be buried in water. That's an absolute, that's an ethic that we need to have. And we can defend it because God said so. Yes, Preston. Yeah, Mike taught a class about that, and that was one of the examples that he used about an absolute, you know, there's not any question. There's some things that aren't, there's some things that are. Right. That's true. There's, some things are ethical, some things are absurd, some things are not. And that's why I said, I think, for me, it takes a combination of all those things that we were talking about put together, and our common sense and our, and our study of, of the scripture should kind of keep us fairly close to being ethical people. I hope, to goodness, that the Lord's church is, is, is at least has the most ethical people as opposed to elsewhere. I mean, you, you can go to a lot of clubs and a lot of guys that do a lot of good things, but I think that the, the actual example of good ethics should come from us as Christians, from us as members of the church. People should be able to look at us and how we act and say, well, I know what their ethic is. You know, they're, uh, they're following what Jesus said in the scriptures. I've seen it. I've seen it in action. That's all the same part of it. Even though they, and there's there's absolutes in the scripture. There's some that are not. There's some that are suggested to us. Some of them we're left to our own freedom of choice. We can look at it and say, okay, for me this is right. But you know, it, it, the scriptures also say that if it's sin to you, it's sin. Don't do it. It may not be to me. Paul talked about it with the meat that was uh, was uh, blessed for the idols. And he said, I'm going to eat it. He said, it'll be okay. It's okay for me. But if you think it's wrong, don't do it. Then it's wrong. It's unethical for you to do it if you don't believe it. Such as calculating the possible effect of their words on others. This is what, i get back to where I was at when I was, instead of chasing my rabbit here. Uh, it's really important, and I don't know how many times that, that it's happened to you, but to me, I've said something and I've watched people's faces kind of drop. And I know, ooh, I just said the wrong thing. You know, I've, I've offended them. I've done something that's, uh, that's against their ethics. 
their beliefs. And that's what really ethics is. It's beliefs, believing what's right and what's wrong. I think that's a simpler uh, definition than the one they had in the dictionary. My ethics is what I believe right and what I believe is wrong. Your ethics is what you believe is right, what you believe is wrong. We're guided by all these things that we've been talking about. But it's not the end of the, of the, of the means. We uh, formed our ethics, and that results in what happens at the end. The end may justify, say, well, look, excuse me, I got one more. Yeah, there we go. The end may justify good means, but it doesn't justify the use of any means. I think that what we have to do, again, is, is put all this on that scale of, uh, of goodness and balance that we have with God and say, uh, this, is, this is what we need to do because God said this is what's right. And if he says it's right, it's right. All right, the next, <laughs> right at the bell, the next uh, lesson we'll actually get into something we can really argue about uh, is capital punishment. Is it ethical or is it not ethical? And you come with your opinions and we'll discuss it. And the reason I chose that is because when in just a couple of weeks, Oklahoma is fixing to execute uh, one of their prisoners. So it's in the news. It's something that we'll at least partially be thinking about. And so I think next week will be a good time to study or at least uh, talk about the ethics of capital punishment. And we'll see how that goes. And that'll be a lot, that'll be a lot more uh, conducive to discussion than what this was tonight. So bear with me. We, we, got, we slogged through the the boring parts, maybe we'll get into the, to the fun parts next week. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm going to let you out just before the bell rings. So thank you very much. Have a good evening and a blessed week.